Hey, good evening. I'm Richard Waller, Executive Director of the University Museums at the University of Richmond. Thank you for joining us this evening for the opening of our exhibition, Menace Citron, The Uncharted Course from Realism to Abstraction, on view in the Joel and Lila Harnett Museum of Art. Organized and circulated on its national tour by the Juniata College Museum of Art in Huntington, Pennsylvania, the Menace Citron retrospective was curated by Jennifer Streb, Associate Professor of Art History and Curator of the Museum, in collaboration with Christiane Citron, the artist's granddaughter. At the Harnett Museum of Art, the exhibition is made possible in part with support from the Lewis S. Booth Arts Fund. It is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Christiane Citron. As I mentioned, Chris is the granddaughter of Mena Citron, equally important to the close relationship she had with her grandmother. She has become a scholar of the art of Mena Citron and is the art executor of the estate of the artist. Chris started acting as an agent for her grandmother when she was attending law school at New York University after graduating from Yale College in the first class of women. She was thrilled to travel to Paris with her grandmother, Minna, and later enjoyed making a trip to Tennessee to see the post office murals that the artist had created in the 1930s. Chris has worked as an education lawyer and in nonprofit administration. She served as the executive director of the Colorado Center for the Book, the state affiliate of the Library of Congress. She has been heavily involved with arts and historic preservation. She served as chair of the board of the Arveda Center for the Arts and Humanities, a city in the suburbs of, of Denver, and helped save from demolition the Mayan Theater, an incredible Art Deco movie palace in Denver. The title of her talk this evening is Mena Citron, From Self-Expression to Abstract Expressionism and Beyond. Following her talk, we will hopefully have some time for a few questions. Then please join us for the reception and to see the Mena Citron exhibition. Please welcome Christiane Citron. Well, thank you for coming, and um, you know, I, I, we never called her grandma, I, we called her Minna, and um, as she said in her 80s, I'm an experimental person, that's what gives me my zest for life. She lectured and wrote extensively traveling around the world, particularly Latin America and Europe, um, talking about art and particularly the meaning of modern art. And um, I grew up amidst all that. And in the writings she um, produced, she wrote an essay called The Uncharted Course. And that is the title that we've given to this exhibit. Um, because it was about her process and how she created, but it also was really um, a metaphor for her life. She didn't have an end goal. And I, I hope if I succeed today, I will attempt to chart um, this uncharted course and to show you how she evolved, um, which seems, to, I think, to make a great deal of sense um, from being a social commentary, figurative, representational artist to part of the first generation of New York abstract expressionists. Um, part of the whole crowd of Jackson Pollock, Franz Klein, Mark Rothko, and all of those. And then how she moved even beyond all that into um, more abstract. Meanwhile, always um, being an artist in residence, writing and talking about it. So um, I will be in the gallery afterwards to um, tell you stories. Many of these pictures um, do have 
um, a backstory. There are lots of anecdotes, and I won't really have time to tell them here. Oh, I encourage you to read the labels. There, there's some. We've got some great anecdotes and little histories about particular pictures there. Also, wanted to mention that I'm very glad to email anybody articles or images of things or links links to some of the things. There is video about her that you could see online, and I'd be happy to um, provide any of that to you. Um, I, I want to say one more aside about the size of the pictures um, here. She did paint all, lots of large pictures. You're going to be seeing in the gallery m more smaller ones, but we'll see in here some of the larger ones, but she, she did not just paint smaller things. There is a catalog book available. Um, it's over there in the gallery that you can buy if you want. And um, I want to thank Jennifer Streb, who um, is a professor at Juniata. She and I organized this together, and it's been a, a really thrilling process. And Jennifer Streb did her dissertation on MINA, and there's an electronic link to that, which I'd be glad to provide. Um, I want to thank Richard for his great enthusiasm and to the university for all their support. I am so pleased with how the installation looks. It's just, it's gorgeous. And as you will um, hear, in fact, there is a picture. Um, Minna was Minna Wright before she got married, and that's her mother, Lena. Um, Minna wrote some memoirs, and one of the stories was Mama's Purple Petticoat. And I'm particularly pleased, I told Richard, with the um, uh, exterior facade and the, the theme color of uh, the installation is purple. So that's very, very nice. So, um, Minna um, grew up in Brooklyn. She was born in 1896. Um, I, those are her parents. I'm showing you this because she looks so sort of demure and Victorian, which I never knew, and it's just amazing to me to think um, how, where she started from. I, I think of her as one of the, the new woman, you may have heard that term, but the early turn of the century of women um, who were becoming um, liberated. They were discovering um, that they could work. They were discovering about planned parenthood. And in 1920, that Minna was 24, she got to vote. So she married, and there is my grandfather, Henry. And then here she is um, as the doting mother of my father. This is 1920. And again, I think she looks very much the um, a uh, comfortable, settled housewife. Well, that didn't last for too long um, because what happened was she discovered psychoanalysis. So in the 20s, she went into many years of psychoanalysis. And this was her analyst, Dr. Frank Wood Williams. And this was a magazine of the then newly hatched psychi psychiatry, psychology profession. Um, mental hygiene. Remember that title because it figures in a picture. But Minna um, uh, decided she wanted more. She decided to go and learn how to draw. She went first to the New York School of Applied Design for Women, and then she went to the Art Students League of New York, which you see here. So this was really formative, and this was an exciting time. This is now the late 20s. Um, she became part of the so-called 14th Street School, which is centered on Union Square. And that's where she then lived for the rest of her life. And had, we had her studio there on Union Square until the late 90s. Um, she, so she moved from Brooklyn and she lived in the village, and she was a student of Kenneth Hayes Miller there. And um, there was a wonderful exhibit here in Richmond, some of you may have seen it a year or two ago, of Kenneth Hayes Miller and his students, which featured um, Minna among the other people. And Richmond, I'm very happy to say, owns a number of Minna 
pictures in the permanent collection. And in addition to the gallery downstairs, you can go and see those, I don't know, tonight, can they see it? Yes. Tonight as well. Um, see those um, pictures, some of which I'll show you tonight. Um, so um, these were the other people in of the 14th Street School. Ed Lanning, Reg Marsh, Minna. Isabel Bishop, the Sawyer brothers. And equally, I consider a member of the group is Walter Bro, a Bowery bum, who they picked up, and Minna has written stories about that, and um, this is really the best part. This is a Life magazine story about Walter Bro. Um, if you've seen the wonderful Richmond newsletter announcing this exhibit, um, this picture, Cold Comfort, is featured in there. And this is Cold Comfort reproduced in Life magazine, um, along with the other pictures by Reginald Marsh. They're all pictures using Walter Bro as the model, and um, which was a thrill for him. And Minna has written a s story about it all. And um, as Minna said, you know, any, of, any artist would have killed to get a feature story in Life magazine, but it was about Walter Bro. So um, anyway, he was wonderful, and you will see him in some of her pictures as well as in some of the others. So um, by the early 30s then, she has really, um, well, I guess the title speaks for itself, self-expression. And um, there is her posed in a photograph, and then she did the painting, and she did a print. Often she would make a drawing, a print, and a painting of the same subject. And um, uh, she, you know, she was rather unflattering about herself. Now, um, in 19... In the early 30s then, and 1935, she has an exhibit called Feminanities. And this is really um, something. This is about the role of women. And this beauty culture, note that the question mark is part of the title. And um, you need to especially notice that the name of this beauty salon is Scalpers. And um, anyway, what I promised you about mental hygiene, this lady on the um, far right who looks like her eyes are popping out of her head with shock or titillation um, under these kind of atomic bomb-like hair dryers, what she's holding in her hand that she's so shocked by is the magazine Mental Hygiene. So. This was really a big thing for Minna. This becomes, this examination of the unconscious and pursuing what's deep within you and expressing yourself is really her driving force. Now this, Hope Springs Eternal, um, the painting is not here, it's huge, it's the size bigger than a door, um, but the print is here and um, she had alternate, she often had an alternate title. The alternate title is demonstration, or I always referred to it as bargain basement. But it's a makeup demonstration by this glamorous gal to these poor bedraggled women who have no hope, and it also would be rather futile for them to try to be as glamorous as her. So she was, oh, she was poking fun at these social norms. And um, I, I'm showing you these articles from then, which I get a huge kick out of. This one from the New York World Telegram, 1935. You know, woman artist tries to ridicule feminine silliness with brush. And there's um, Hope Springs Eternal in the um, middle. And this picture of her, um, to me, she looks really like a flapper, but I mean, what a, what a change from, you know, these earlier images of her growing up. This one on the right is uh, a Time, is Time magazine, and um, so she was getting quite the reputation and prominence by 1935. And... Um, it's, it, I, I get a kick out of um, how these reviewers say something like, well, we heard about her biting satire and we were expecting this rather sharp-edged, belligerent person. And she comes in and she's jovial and she's good-looking. And um, gee, 
we were surprised. <laughs> so um, anyway, then here's Minna painted a lot of different um, images of women. The uh, the one in the center in this exhibit needed women, age limit 75. Um, I mean, this is this is a work a job line for these poor old ladies. And um, she earns an honest living. That is in the Richmond um, permanent collection. And, um, you know, so she's making commentary through these titles. And then Lady with a Program. And then here's a couple of paintings of women that I thought you might enjoy. Many of these paintings, um, most of these paintings are in different museum um, collections. So by um, 1934, though, she, she has decided she's going to get a divorce. And you couldn't get a divorce in New York. Um, the only basis was adultery. So she went to Reno. This is the time, if you've seen the, the play or the movie, The Women, Claire Booth Luce. And I, I, I think Minna's things are actually slightly before that was published. Um, so it's a whole series that she did out in Reno, the Gambling House series. Um, this, by the way, is Walter Bro. He wasn't in Reno, but he was the model. But she made lots of drawings when she was out there. And this, she got quite a bit of press um, for this. And so she came back, um, so, you know, by 1934 she's divorced. Now, um, I found this clipping in her scrapbook when we were getting ready to, um, when we were preparing this, this catalog book. Um, and um, this newspaper clipping absolutely cracks me up. So it's a, a joint um, review. It's about Andrew Wyeth and also someone else and, and Minna. And what it says is, um, Minna Citron, who is, of course, far better known than Andrew Wyeth. So I thought that was quite interesting about passage of time and um, how, how, about artists' reputations. And um, I didn't know the attribution, so I contacted the Wyeth estate, and it was really quite funny because um, Minna had saved it, but if you can see, it's cut. There's the first joint paragraph, and then there's the part about her. Well, what I found in the, the Wyeth, Andrew Wyeth scrapbook, he also kept the first part about both of them, but then just the part about himself, just like she had kept just, she kept just, see, that's just the part about her. And I guess that's pretty par for the course, but I, I got a big kick out of that. And... Um, so late 30s, um, Minna um, applied for, in the New Deal, she applied in the Treasury Fine Arts Program, which is blind competition. The awards were made on merit, not by your income status being so low. And she won the commission to paint a post office mural in Tennessee. And um, so here she is working on it on the left. And that mural, um, uh, is still there in Tennessee and um, I didn't even know till the 70s that she had done this because that was back then she had moved beyond this she was not interested in what she had done back in the 30s so um, one of the pictures she also did when she was in Tennessee was magic box which um, you probably can't see from here but you see the poor field workers are looking with awe and um, excitement at something. And what that is is an electricity fuse box. And on it, it has a smiley face. And, um, and then there's a print that she made from it. And then here she is posed in front of the finished picture. So um, this mural opened in New York um, before it got installed in Tennessee. And there's lots of stories about all this whole Tennessee um, phase, which is for about really almost two years, many months at a time, she spends in this tiny town in Tennessee. This is the um, opening catalog for the exhibit, which was at the Art Students League in 1940. And David Lilienthal, the director of the TVA, came and he wrote this and he, he um, rhapsodized about the mural 
because it, the mural was about the TVA. Minna was just thrilled with the progress um, and comfort that it was bringing to poor people who didn't have the most basic things in life. And um, she later says, the hard edge of my satire disappeared after this because I was so thrilled with the idealism of the New Deal and what was being, what was being achieved, and I was just so happy. Uh, Lilienthal says that um, he, he had hoped that engineers and artists would get together on the idea of how they showed things and that Minna had done this. This showed that artists and engineers could get together and that not only had she shown what the TVA was all about, but that she um, captured the spirit of it. And he quotes Carl Sandburg, the, a, a book-length poem, which is very interesting to look at, The People, Yes. So um, if you haven't realized it, Minna was very much um, a progressive, popularist, leftist, and was um, really just thrilled with, with what the New Deal was doing. And actually, the TVA had been a subject of controversy. And um, so, in fact, Minna's mural, coming when it did, right in the final, in the month before the election for the third term, um, was very nice. So Eleanor Roosevelt came to the opening. And um, I've loved seeing the correspondence about that, where she wrote to the Treasury Fine Arts people about this and she says, well I think I need some guidance for how do you deal with royalty coming? And they wrote back, oh don't worry at all, you'll feel like you always knew her when you, as soon as you meet her. And anyway, Minna was just absolutely thrilled that Eleanor Roosevelt came to the opening of her mural. So the mural was very well um, received and based on that success she earned a second commission for another mural in Tennessee, and this one is Horse Swapping Day, and that's in another t small town, Manchester, um, Tennessee. Both of those murals are still there. That one is still in a post office, uh, although it's a different post office. The first one in Newport, Tennessee, is um, still there in Newport, but relocated to a small community center. And um, so these murals were, I was thrilled when I discovered them. And as I said, I didn't even know about that until the 70s when I was in the South. And, I, and then I found out about it and I wanted to make a pilgrimage to go see it, which I did do. And there are a lot more things I could tell you about that. But um, anyway, here's another picture of her, um, one of the Tennessee pictures. So, um, a subject of great interest and concern to Minna was the situation of workers and labor. And she did a, a number of pictures about that. This strike news, um, that's in the Wolfsonian uh, Museum in Florida. Um, and the workers are gathered around the newspaper to see what's happening about the strike. Um, she, um, she loved to tell these stories about that. that the New York Times w did, in fact, reproduce it. And, um, but they told her they, didn't want, they wanted to change the title. They did not want to have it called Strike News. They wanted to just say The News. And she laughed about that and said that anyone who, who's got any uh, know-how would see there's no smoke coming out of the chimneys at the factory, so they'd know that they were on strike. But um, here's another one, which I only recently discovered, Welder, which I think um, is, is quite amazing. So, um, you know, she wasn't just doing these pictures of women primping. And um, so now the war comes, and she, she did a whole series called New York in Wartime. And that traveled around the country, um, Washington, D.C., Oklahoma, Denver. San Francisco and Smith College, among other places. And this one is a lot of fun. It's called What the Well-Dressed Woman Wears to the Opera, namely a military uniform. And Minna wrote and spoke quite a bit about how pleased she was to see women um, achieving this. And um, for instance, at 
uh, gatherings um, where she was a speaker about women in art in the 70s um, representing uh, various women's groups, um, she said, I have always identified as a feminist. So um, 1945, construction, it's construction workers, but you can see it's beginning to go abstract. You can still tell that it's construction workers, but it's coming apart. And that's, that's the direction that she goes in, because by the mid-40s, she joins Atelier 17, which is a pivotal um, institution in American art. Um, Atelier 17 was a print workshop. It had been in Paris. It was led by Stanley William Hayter. And uh, with the war, these artists sought refuge in New York. And so people like Marc Chagall and Salvador Dali and a whole number of other surrealists and greats of European art were there experimenting. The whole key of this workshop, and this has been quite a bit written about, was experimentation and stretching what you could do with printmaking. And um, Minna joined this, and um, other New York artists who were part of Atelier 17 were Mark Rothko and Jackson Pollock, who was unknown at that point. Um, so this was a radical thing to do. Remember, she was part of a whole social group and a, uh, of the 14th Street School. They were they shared interest in depicting gritty street life. But they also shared social life, and here she was making, going off in a different path. Now, Kenneth Hayes Miller, who was the, her mentor, um, warned her, and she says this over and over in um, interviews and in writing. He said, Minna, if you do this, you will lose your following, meaning go abstract. And she said she didn't care. She wasn't interested in what people thought. She wasn't doing it for money. And that the only thing that mattered to her was the freedom to pursue what she needed to pursue. And she was wanting to explore the unconscious and producing things in a way that let herself explore and do new things with new materials in different ways and different techniques. One of the big things was automatism and letting it kind of happen. <laughs> and um, there was a, a significant influence of the surrealists. So this is the mid-40s, and she becomes very much a um, core part of Atelier 17. And this, which is um, one of my favorite and many people's favorite pictures, um, I wanted to show you how it evolved. So um, the name of the picture is Men Seldom Make Passes, dot, dot, dot. Now, some of you may not know, so I will tell you that that is the famous first line of Dorothy Parker, who is a great wit, part of the Algonquin Round Table. And I was telling people earlier today, would we think she could be, let's say, like Lady Gaga now? And um, anyway, so this is a Dorothy Parker quote. And um, so you can see, if you think back to self-expression, this is how the, the, you know, it starts with this self-portrait on the artist's stool before the easel. But, and there's several more. This is what's called a state, so it's her first evolving step, and there are many more toward the finished print, Men Seldom Make Passes, which is here in this exhibit. This, this is the painting that she did, which I have, and which, um, which I love, and um, which I hadn't even been aware of had been done, because it had gotten... I actually bought it from somebody. I, I was amazed and thrilled. So um, this one is in all sorts of major collections everywhere and won a lot of prizes and um, is just, I think, terrific. Now, Memories of Childhood um, is um, a significant 
painting, um, it was in Paris, in New York, 1946, Paris, 1947, Cuba, 1949. And um, she wrote about it. Um, she wrote an artist's statement. And I thought it was interesting. Um, she said, I was not conscious of the subject matter when I started the painting. My concern was with the relationships of the elements of design, form, line, space, color, and texture, and with the problems of keeping my intuitive, emotional expression free and inventive. Only as the painting evolved did I realize that the symbols, forms, and colors were unifying into a pattern of childhood memories. So, um, and that's one that hung in our house as when I was growing up, and I didn't know that the title was Memories of Childhood, so it is um, for me. And um, I think you can see, um, well, that's, that's the artist's statement that she wrote, and she talks about some of the places that it, was, it had been exhibited and um, what various uh, scholars had said about it in Paris. Um, mauve mirror, which is in this exhibit, has um, some of the same motif, actually, that um, were in Memories of Childhood. And then Shattered Monocle is, um, there's a whole series where she's really exploring optics and perception. It seems like there's this eye, and then she's exploring texture, and... Um, it's, she, she did a lot of that, and I think that really, I, I mean, these are all Atelier 17, and, and she really was getting more and more into the exploring the unconscious. This one, Squid Under Pier, won numerous prizes and um, was chosen by Atelier 17 to represent Atelier 17 at a, a particular exhibit. Um, she, she's written about it. Um, one of the pioneering things is the use of this netting on the print plate. Um, and um, again, you can see these, I mean, it's under a dock in the water, but there are these eyes, and then she writes about it. And I think I put some, some of that, well, definitely we have a lot about that in the catalog book, and on the label I think it has some of the quotations um, from her. So the Uncharted Course is this essay she wrote, which I think is, represents what she was all about. I've been interested in the use of accident. So she writes about, um, you know, if the print plate broke or something slipped, you take advantage of that and go from there. And um, so she was very interested and, as I said, lectured about the artistic process. Um, and here she's talking about the artist communicates the creative activity of which it is both the product and the expression. Uh, she, she worked a lot, exhibited a lot in Paris. Here she is reflected in a mirror, which I like because of um, these, the picture shattered mirror and these optics. Um, then um, she was, been through the 40s, she was summering in Provincetown. There she is in the back row. This Forum 49 was a, um, actually a very important, pivotal event where people like Motherwell, Gottlieb, Adolf Gottlieb, all the, these people, and Minna were um, there giving lectures and exhibiting um, for the summer. And I, somebody, um, somebody should write about that because there's a lot to be found. And there really aren't any books and not many articles about it. And it really is quite fascinating as these are the New York artists who become so famous for abstract expressionists and they were up there because of Hans Hoffman. So this was a picture um, that she exhibited there. And... Um, the Provincetown um, is part of the title, and um, it's a lot of fun to contemplate. So you'll see that one here. This one, Thread of Ariadne, is, is not here, but I wanted to show you just again for being characteristic of work at this time. 
And um, this is instructors at the Art Students League. There she is. Uh, Lloyd Goodrich is, is next to her. And then in the middle next to him is Reginald Marsh. And then over toward the right, the one who looks like Ichabod Crane is Kenneth Hayes Miller. So um, anyway, but then um, because of the Motherwell connection, he told her, well, he built a house. There's interesting stories about that in East Hampton. But um, she, she rented his studio. This is the Motherwell studio in East Hampton. And um, there's yours truly next, and my cousin. We're with Minna there in um, one of her um, not terribly dignified poses. <laughs> and um, anyway, this is, this is an East Hampton painting which um, I love. She, um, she, on the back of this title, it, it, she wrote Jam Session. And I think you can feel this sense of movement and the musical notes, and it's very um, lively. And that's, it's one of my favorites. And um, as I said, and now I can't remember, I've been talking a lot today, whether I already said tonight about what she said about Jackson Pollock. She said, Jackson Pollock had a great freeing influence on us. He, he, he freed us up to be more experimental and to let it all spew out. So I would say that this is an action painting. Um, throughout the 50s um, and on, on def in the 60s, she was artist in residence at Yaddo and McDowell and many other places. Um, here's a um, painting dis decomposition of a still life. And um, I thought this, this letter um, was from a longtime um, museum director in Newark. He wrote this to me saying, I remember Minna standing up in the audience at the auditorium at MoMA, scolding the curators for having the work of only one woman artist, Georgia O'Keeffe, in a show of 25 contemporary artists in the late 1950s. And then he goes on to say she helped so much with getting the women artist groups recognized and shown on an international basis. So here's an article. Um, she wrote in the College Art Journal, communication between spectator and artist. And this is at a time where about abstract art, people were saying, oh, any child could do this. And so she's writing about what is abstract art and talking all about the unconscious. And um, what I get a kick out of is the illustrations she used for this. She had a, a Franz Klein picture and then um, a crazy person's picture, and then a picture by me at four years old, and a cousin, and my cousin, one by my cousin at four years old. So we were in good company. The point was that we, you know, it's not true that any child could do that. And um, she lectured a lot there. That's a lecture tour poster from 1959, and it's all over the place. Um, now this, this is a wonderful um, oil painting from 1960, The Moon Takes Up Its Wondrous Tale. I just thought I wanted to show you that because that's about three feet by four feet. And, um, and here's a picture of Minna in her studio and maybe you can see a little bit that here's, you know, a pretty large canvas. By the mid-60s, um, Blue Band is one that's here. Um, that the, the way she made this is quite interesting, and that, that was a paint can lid that she used there. And then here she is holding a hammer in her hand in her studio. There, see the, the paint can lid down there? And I think that the, um, that pattern down there on blue band came from the bottom half of, I mean, she, she would use and reuse all kinds of things in different ways. Yeti um, is part of the exhibit, but we didn't travel because it's too fragile. It's a sand, what we call a sand painting because there's actually sand mixed in with the oil paint. And I think a lot of the um, East Hampton people maybe did do that. And um, she did a number of ones like that. But by the, in the 60s, she's really um, 
moving on to experimenting with much more sort of purely conceptual and hard edge kind of things. And that's, that's a couple of examples um, of that. Here, here she is with um, Hayter in Paris in 1977. Um, they clearly had a very long-standing, very close relationship, and he had such a huge influence um, on her. And so um, Minna visited me in Denver when, let's see, so she's, um, she's 88. And um, that's in my backyard. And she brought me this, which is in the exhibit, De Tache Rouge. And um, I had visited her studio the previous year and admired that. And so she, she carried that out on the plane. And I was really touched. And um, I love that one. Um, when you see it, um, it has this real, it, it's like going into a grotto and she's exploring color. I mean, so this, she made this in 83 and so she's 87 years old and she's, the color, it's very calm and exploring color and um, anyway, I had particularly liked it. And um, she had said about Rothko that um, I find a great serenity um, in his work, and to me that one is some Rothko-esque. So um, this is this is a kick. Some of you may have seen this poster before, or the picture. I forget which museum. I think it may be in the the originals in the Brooklyn Museum. Isn't that right? Yeah. So it's called Some Living American Women Artists. There's Minna. I hate the picture. She submitted it, so I guess. Anyway, um, so. You know, in her late 80s, she's getting lots of awards. And the Women's Caucus for Art was something very important to her. And they gave her this lifetime award. And I have uh, copies of these things, if anyone's interested. And um, there's another award. And um, this is a self-portrait she did in 1970 and then here's a pic photograph in 1977 and that obviously is a very characteristic expression she had. She had this impish expression. Here she is at age 90 and um, here she is in front of a, an earlier self-portrait and um, so this is when she's 90 and um, here's an oil painting she did um, and she's returned to exploring color and abstract expressionism in these very late works, which we have quite a few here, and they've never been exhibited before. And um, this is one of her last pictures, and Worlds Within World. I think it's, um, she's contemplating mortality, or the place of the earth, and also environment, the plight of the earth. But there's Mama's purple petticoat there, and there's the little earth and water and fire. And so it, it, it seems she's just contemplating the cosmos there. So that's one of her very last pictures. Um, she was a, a mentor to many young women artists, and um, this talks about the duties of a mentee to walk along with her as she collects things from the street that she might use in a picture and what a big influence she was. And that's behind the scenes of uh, making this exhibit. And see over the mantelpiece, that's actually, that's memories of childhood. If you can see the cardboard boxes that are way over my head. So, um, I, I guess just in closing, what I would say um, to take away about Minna, um, exper experimentation. Her biggest put down would be if you stay put. Um, wit, lyricism, that she was interested in the unconscious, colorist, that she was a feminist, and that she was a, a teacher. And um, I would love to answer questions, and then we'll do more questions over in the gallery where I can point out more things. So.
Who has a question? Yes. Now, I'm going to um, repeat the question, and will you correct me if I don't have it right? The question is, did I? Did I meet any of these famous artists, and if so, who? No, before they became so famous. Oh, before they became famous. Well, I grew up in East Hampton, and these people were on the beach, and we, I mean, well, they certainly weren't as famous and mythic and legendary as they are now. I, I tell people stories that, I mean, you know, a lot of them were pretty um, uncouth. Um, as, a, as a child, child's perspective, I mean, they weren't necessarily nice. Many of them were drunk. And um, they were not, this whole, as a group, the, this group was not very good to women. Not that I was really aware of that then, but I mean, I just think, um, I don't know. But I do, um, I mean, we had a, I don't know if I have time to tell the Jackson Pollock story, but um, on August 11th, 1956, we were taking our babysitter home when we came upon an overturned car. I mean, no, well, the, when a car passed us going very, very fast on a curve like that, and then we came upon an overturned car, and that was Jackson Pollock. So he and one um, passenger died, the other one survived, but my father tried to call the police. My mother was um, eight months pregnant, and then the next day my father went back to New York City. This is out on Long Island. And um, then the next morning, Monday morning, August 13th, 1956, my little brother was born a month prematurely. So I say I have an intimate connection with Jackson Pollock's death. But, um, I, yeah, I mean, I knew, I, I certainly, um, I mean, I, I met all of those 14th Street people probably repeatedly over the years. Isabel Bishop's st uh, studio was very close to Minna's. We'd often say hello to her. Um, and, uh, I mean, I, I guess I, I knew quite a few of them, but, you know, as a child, so. <laughs> So um, the question was that she was a very dynamic person, hard to imagine having a grandmother like that, I agree. <laughs> um, and um, did she work in any other medium, uh, such as uh, sculpture or pottery or jewelry? Is that? OK. Um, she she did a lot of drawing. She did these construction. A lot of these things, for instance, that construction on plata, the one with the kind of um, stainless steel stuff, and some of these others. They're called constructions. So, um, but I don't think that's what you meant. She uh, she may have done one little sculpture or something, but no, she didn't do sculpture. She didn't do jewelry. Um, I mean, she was known as a master printmaking. She won so many awards for that and for teaching that and then doing a lot of draw, drawing. And she certainly did um, experiment with materials, but in the sense of making a visual construction that would go on the wall, I think. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, she asked if um, I was ever inspired to do any artwork. And I'm sorry, you, that was the other part of your question, too. Um, and so um, the answer is no. <laughs> um, I, I say that I wasn't creative, but I've decided I am creative in the sense of putting this stuff together and discovering about it. But I'm a word person and not... Um, I really don't have any, I don't think I have any talent in, in creating um, art, but I, I 
think I have talent in appreciating it. I mean, I've bought a few prints a long time ago by some other um, other artists that I think were, it was smart that I bought them. I mean, for instance, um, John Sloan, and I didn't mention John Sloan. I should just backtrack to say that this, for those of you who don't know, the 14th Street School is basically the next generation of what's called the Ashcan School, and or the Eight, and those are people who did urban life, scenes from urban life. And um, anyway, John Sloan was one of those. And I love John Sloan's pictures. Anyway, John Sloan, I should have said, was one of Min Minna's um, instructors and very influential um, to her, as well as the others. I mean, I think the whole 14th Street School, they are the children of John Sloan. And um, anyway, so um, I, I was a, I have a John, two John Sloan prints, which, which I loved. And, um, and, and I've been involved with the arts, but in an organizing kind of, I like to organize and projects and writing about it, but I don't do art. Now my daughter, who I'm very proud of, I think um, has some art. She, she, she's a good painter. And um, I do think it's interesting how these things um, skip generations. Minna had two sons. I really didn't tell you much about personal life. Um, but she had two sons. My father was the older one, and so Casper and then Tom. And um, both served during the war, World War II. And um, well, she, I, she, she, told, she tells this story, I'm not sure if it's on the video in the gallery or a different one, but she says, Louise Nevelson and I were on the back stairs at the League, that's the Art Students League, and um, Louise said, come on, I'm going to Paris, you should come. And Minna said, well, I can't, I've got these two boys. And it, Louise said, oh, that's not a problem, leave them with your mother, come on. And Minna did not go. Um, but um, anyway, um, my point was going to be that my father had absolutely no interest in, in art, really. And I, I don't think her other son, I mean, neither of them really, I mean, they were proud, but um, needed to be kind of at a remove. I mean, she was, um, she, she, as, a, as a mother, I think it, it was, um, probably kind of a challenge in the 30s for them. Whereas, you know, I had my own beloved mother and Minna was my um, source of excitement. And um, I, I did, sp I've spent lots of time with her over the years and I, I was telling Richard, I mean, we would be riding up on, on the bus, the Madison Avenue bus in New York City and um, she was quite hard of hearing. This would be when she's in her late 80s. And she's very loudly telling these sex jokes. And the whole bus would be just convulsing with laughter. And I'm <laughs> So she, she was, she, you know, she, as a child, you know, other people had grandmothers who made cookies and taught you how to knit knit and things. And uh, I did want to say one, another quote um, from Roanoke, Virginia. From, um, it's on one of the labels in the gallery. Um, I think it's 1965. Anyway, she was artist in residence. It was a Ford Foundation artist residency in Roanoke, Virginia. And the newspaper interviewer said that when they met her, they thought that she was a painter of potted geraniums on the windowsill. And um, that's what they expected. And then when they went to see her pictures, they said um, that, uh, let's see, she paints, um, she paints like a um, young, with the heft of a young man in his 20s. <laughs> So um, probably we should do, continue the conversation in the gallery and I'd love to you know, point out things in different pictures and thank you again for coming. Thank you.